We have one of the most innovative arts and history departments in the country. And what makes them particularly unique is this uh, marriage that they have between arts and history. You don't see that in most other cities in the United States. And the other thing that they've been doing besides just the absolutely remarkable public arts program that we have here for a city of our size and for the limited resources that they have is the establishment of a new cultural planner position that Karen Bubb is now taking on. And why that's so important is that for so long the arts have been treated as a as the periphery, as something that is nice to have rather than instrumental into how we shape our cities and how we shape our communities. And this notion that we can have a cultural planner that's designed specifically to leverage the arts in relation to urban planning, in relation to public policy, in relation to livability, that this is a really important step um, and that we see arts as a transitional language of how we can help bring community members along in conversations about sustainability and resilience. I'm the cultural planner for the city of Boise and I uh, manage strategic plans like the cultural plan but also kind of initiatives that are related to that. Boise had never done a, a full-scale cultural master plan and in uh, 2016 we undertook to do that and part of what a, what a cultural master plan is is really an inventory of what currently exists and then really getting feedback from the community about what do we want to be there, what's missing, where are those gaps. So we did a lot of community outreach when that plan was created. We did um, focus groups, public meetings, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and gathered incredible amount of feedback from over a thousand people. And we primarily were, were asking, you know, what does culture mean to you? Where do you find it? What's missing? If you were king or queen and could, could say, I want this, you know, what would you create? I think that's one of the really important things about the public art program is the, what we strive towards that level of transparency and engagement with the community. And really, the, I think citizens can have a really direct avenue towards impacting the built environment of the city through our process. First, in the development of projects um, on an annual basis when we receive the funding allocations, we start to identify, you know, based on goals that have been outlined in things like the Cultural Master Plan, Blueprint Boise, which is the overarching sort of plan for the city development, and then looking towards neighborhood plans as well and trying to identify, you know, based on the location that we're looking at, um, who the major stakeholders might be. That always includes, you know, the citizens that are impacted in that area. So it starts at the very beginning with just conceiving of the project parameters and then involving the public comment period. And when we get to artist selection or project selection as part of a design phase, we work with the commission, which is mayoral appointed citizens that serve as our approval body. We have a group of the arts and history advisory team, which is a group of volunteer citizens that help us on certain initiatives. And so there's, there's really a lot of I think there's a lot of ways that the public can be involved in, in the outcome of our projects and even to the point of how we're directing projects and directing funds into projects. In 2014, we, am, we worked with all of the arts organizations in our region to put together a list that we could actually survey to figure out what's it like to be an artist in the Treasure Valley. What are the characteristics of the artists that live and work here? Uh, and trying to get a sense of where our strengths and our weaknesses as a region, as a place to be an artist and to do that kind of work here. We found like a lot of really interesting information from that particular story. Um, the first being that 50% of the artists that we interviewed are actually entrepreneurs and innovators in their own right who have started businesses. And so I think that's really helpful to start to unpack these myths and break down these myths that these artists are isolated creatures and are weird in some way, but are actually really important cultural innovators. And so it's really important for us to understand how they innovate, um, the different ways that they are trying to create new emerging businesses. Um, and the different ways that we can support them from an economic development perspective. We did do a, a study, a survey last year, actually uh, Dr. Ashley helped us with that survey with the Downtown Boise Association to um, query the uh, business or property owners in terms of their value of public art and their value of, of art events in the downtown core. And there was a great um, interest that was demonstrated in terms of how they feel the presence of public art and the presence of art events helps to encourage their businesses and to encourage people to patronize downtown Boise. So that was encouraging to see the support of that. My name is Patrick Bull. I work for uh, Local Construct. I'm the director of construction here. I manage the development platform in the entire uh, Western US. I think it adds a lot to it. I think often like development can potentially be a little bit stale and a little bit too commercialized. I think we try to do it with the architecture first and do something really innovative and unique 
but whenever you can add art to it, I think it just ultimately ups the, the cool factor and kind of creates a place where people want to hang out and, and be. You know, there really seems to be some enthusiasm around arts as an asset, an asset to the community, as an amenity both for the people that are coming downtown, whether it's to shop, to live, to work, and to play, you know? So that kind of way that we start talking about the value of downtown today and why we see them booming and having a comeback. And then also just the role that um, artists play as employees in a lot of these different types of firms and the different types of skill sets that they bring and that enrich these particular firms and businesses that they work for. I, I grew up here and when I was growing up, the, the city had taken down a lot of historic buildings and there were a lot of parking lots in downtown Boise. There, were, there was an article that um, said Boise was the city who tried to commit suicide because there was so much that had been removed and not replaced. So when I grew up there was not a sense of Boise as an art town or a creative place to be. And I, I feel that that has shifted, that people do see Boise as a creative place and that particularly the traffic box program is something that is started in downtown Boise but is really spread to the whole city. I feel like uh, that changes people's perception uh, when they're seeing something that is creative by an Idaho artist rather than an advertisement on some on public infrastructure. And that the choice to begin and intensify the public art in the downtown core was purposeful because we had to rebuild our downtown from the, from the ground up essentially and the growth that's happened around it, I feel like is driven by many factors, but I, I do feel that the inclusion of meaningful and aesthetic art is part of that. We host regional and national calls to artists. So we help to kind of filter through all that information and host calls on our website that we think might benefit artists in the area. Uh, we always act as a resource for artists, so individual artists can come and we'll sit down with them and talk about the opportunities that we can offer, other organizations within the community that they can be involved with. I don't think enough artists know that we offer those services, but if someone calls me and says, you know, hey, I want to be more involved, I'm happy to sit down and talk through, you know, the myriad of opportunities that, that could help benefit their practice or their career. We didn't intend to do a mural on that originally, but once we saw the large white wall go up, we realized there was a huge opportunity there to do something really cool. So we worked with uh, Carl Leclerc at the city of Boise. He kind of compiled a list of regional artists for us. And then we put together a request for proposals for artists in the region and got quite a few submittals. And it was pretty fun to go through that process and, and select an artist and, and then uh, commission them to do that, that project. It's also, we're such a young community that it's, it's really also, it's not like the canon, like the you know, Soho in New York City. It's really, the art scene here, the cultural scene here is really about accessibility, and being open to families, being open to, to people who might not feel comfortable going into a museum. So it's very casual, it's very accessible, um, it's very connected. You know, what I can say is from the research that we found that um, a majority of the artists, artists that live here are not able to make a living as an artist, but they have no plans to leave. And so because they like the quality of life that Boise has to offer, it might be where their family is or their job is. And so what we're concerned about happening from an artist workforce development standpoint is that we don't want to lose them. Not just lose them in terms of having them leave their Treasure Valley, but if they are to step outside of an artistic workforce or step outside of an artistic occupation because they can't figure out how to make that work here. And so I think it's important that we continue to figure out how do we enhance those opportunities for people that are emerging artists, mid-career artists, but also people that are very far advanced in their particular careers. Yeah, one thing that we've been hearing, we've hosted two artists in residence at the Castle House. They were both painters, um, both from New York, and some interesting comments that, that they made in observing the arts community here and that it's, it's just fascinating that people care about what you do. People are truly, you know, invested in other citizens or, you know, other artists or other people that are here and what they're doing. And, you know, they said it's so strange that another artist would be genuinely interested in what their practice is, what they're doing, what they're pursuing. Because they said elsewhere, people don't care. You're, you know, you're one in, you know, 100,000 artists that are in New York and no one has the time to care about what you're doing because they're trying to do it too. What we are seeing nationally and what we are seeing play out is that you don't want to just have a singular feature initiative that's connected to the arts, where a lot of the research is, is trying to understand the cultural vitality of a region 
and that might include a variety of different indicators. So do you have public policy programs that support arts incubators? Do you have um, subsidized artist live workspace? Do you have training on how to be a public artist? Do you offer grants? So those are the different types of public policy pieces and there's a whole host that fall underneath there. But then you're also looking for, um, do you have jobs for these people? Do you have different types of entrepreneurship benefits and different type of packages around there? Do you have um, opportunities for them to learn from other people? And so there's all these different kinds of indicators that suggest that certain areas are more robust centers of cultural activity. And so those are, are all important elements, um, but it's not the only thing that you need to really look holistically um, at what really makes a city a true city for an artist or for an art. We always make sure that artists are paid and paid as well as we can. I think that's important as well. We have run different educational programs in the past, such as Public Art Academy, which helps to educate artists on what they need to know to do a public art project. Amy Fackler, our coworker, has also developed um, other workshops that help artists understand the business of art or taxes or other kinds of concerns. So we, we act as a convener and a facilitator. We just recently started doing regional uh, meetings where we work, we actually create a a meeting we did for the first year last year with Nampa and Meridian and Eagle and Garden City to come together to say how can we help each other regionally to make our places more hospitable to artists. So I feel like that advocacy role is really important and that, and that role as an employer has been key. We also help to provide advice and direction and support for the kind of the, the larger cultural ecology. So for instance, uh, Tree Fort was cultural ambassador in a previous year. Uh, this last year, um, World Village and the Morrison Center have been our cultural ambassadors. So they get a, an, an award, they get a grant amount that helps to support them, and it helps to bring pu public attention to them as organizations. So part of it is supporting the, the really great nonprofits that are out there, like the Shakespeare Festival, the Boise Art Museum, Boise Contemporary Theater, that are doing really good work and funneling some money, some grant money to them but then also helping to promote um, the work that they're doing. I think it's also important to remember that the city is just one actor, right? And there's actually a city's made of multiple actors, right? In different departments, the way that planning actually incorporates art and culture or doesn't. The arts and history department, public works and so on, right? So there's all these different types of players in the city of Boise. And the arts and history department works beautifully with them to be able to try to figure out um, different places where that makes sense from an arts and culture perspective to really invest in different types of strategies. You know, we're, we're very public, out, outward facing. So on our website, for instance, there's a, a blog that Carl started and Brooke Burton now currently runs where they go out and interview artists in the community and then post about those artists. And part of that is really to get the voices of the artists in a public place. And right now they're also doing a, a series of uh, interviews at the Castle House where people can come and, and meet those artists and see the interview in person. So things like that, the Castle House is a facility that's open to the public Thursday through Saturday so people can go and see events, do open studios when an artist is there. There's lots of different kind of entry points for a community. Yeah, I think further, like, the Fettuccine Forum is a great platform for community engagement. There's, you know, a single topic, but at the end it oftentimes evolves into a community discussion about how these, you know, prominent topics are impacting the local community. So giving citizens a voice, you know, to engage at that level with staff, with the scholars that we're bringing in, I think is really important. In 2000 was one of our earliest, most critical projects, which was the redesign of the Basque Block. And using design, landscape design, public art to define a space I think was a, a, a turning point for Boise, where we saw the impact that design could have in placemaking. And just after that, in 2001, was when the Percent for Art Ordinance was passed. I do feel like there's some critical projects like that, where there's a concentration of public art that really tells a story, that people, people get it. Um, other projects like that are Boise Watershed, where we have over $3 million invested in art that really tells a story of water and recycling and the importance of conservation. That has been really important. Or another example is the airport. The airport was redone just after the percent for our ordinance was passed and, and art is integrated into the architecture of that space as well as the whole airport. And we're, we're getting ready to do um, another airport expansion and we're currently working on a public art plan for a public works department for the next 10 years. So those, uh, looking into the future, those are two areas where there, there are going to be significant investments in public art that will kind of bring that uh, story forward. And most of the art that, that the city commissions is not uh, art for art's sake. 
it's really art that has a, an underlying connection that, to that place or to the stakeholders for that group. So it's really trying to look for that, um, where that synergy is between what an artist might want to do and what the city does. So it needs to relate to who we are as a city. But I also feel like we're, by being a leader, by helping to support these programs, there are others like um, private developers who have done public art projects that are really about their projects. And uh, Carl has assisted on a couple of these projects, some really big mural projects in downtown Boise that add to that mix, uh, or Free Galley Gallery, that's not a city government project, that's independent project. But I feel like the all of us kind of doing our pieces, it, it brings together this really interesting mix of, of things that are being done in the city. So what's really common practice that you'll see uh, is um, uh, economic impact studies that get done that say, uh, and they're usually largely around like um, nonprofit performing and visual arts um, companies and organizations that that you'll find in the downtown core um, or other parts in a community where um, the argument is if you have those different types of organizations, it means that people will um, spend money in parking garages. It means that people will go to restaurants, they will go to hotels and so on. And so you start to see a churning effect with money and how money is spent in that particular area. Um, there are some things that are troubling about those particular studies is they don't talk about substitution costs. So, well, what if people spent money elsewhere? That's only one way to look at the value of arts economic development in a community. Um, and that tends to be the one that people use most commonly. But in that instance, we often treat arts as an amenity or an asset uh, without really focusing on the role that artists play themselves as um, economic generators, as innovators and entrepreneurs. You know, there are certain businesses that leverage proximity to an artwork, the, you know, to sort of market their business. You know, businesses around Freak Alley definitely benefit from the increased foot traffic, restaurants around there. It's, it's a destination. People spend time looking at the artwork, then want to have a drink or something to eat. And then also, you know, the trend in murals recently, I think, has been uh, a large impetus for more focus on public art and engaging artists in parts of development projects. Um, we've had a couple big murals added to the, the landscape of the city recently, and those were funded but just by the developer um, because of their interest in wanting to attract maybe a specific clientele, specific businesses to the facility that they were developing. So it's interesting to see, we've seen an increase in demand for specifically murals. And so we worked recently with the Planning and Development Services Department uh, here at the city to update and clarify mural guidelines. And so that was really in response to the increase in demand of businesses and property owners and developers coming to us looking for guidance and resources on how to incorporate artists as part of their projects. I think what I mentioned before is it's not a singular program or a singular initiative. It's an entire package, an entire way that you talk about the cultural vitality of a region. Of a region. So it's uh, both the nonprofit arts organizations and the for-profit organizations that are here. It's the artists that are um, working in a variety of different mediums and occupations and professions. It's having the producers and not only produce the art, but sell the art and make it possible for people um, to be able to access that art. It's having opportunities for artists to network with one another and to learn different types of skill sets. It's public policies that uh, provide opportunities to um, enhance a particular craft or to take um, or to give a little bit of money to start seed up, uh, to seed particular types of endeavors or uh, different types of entrepreneurial spirit um, spirits. It's having public transit, it's having diversity, it's having things that aren't necessarily arts related, but that um, attract artists and that make artists want to not just start here, but to stay here. Um, and this is the, the leakage problem that I was talking about earlier that we want to make sure that we uh, counteract. It's about having um, arts programs at the university that not only give people um, particular skill sets in their canon area, uh, but also giving them the ability to be able to transfer that knowledge and be able to translate that knowledge to different employers. It's wonderful programming um, like Tree Fort um, and um, farmers markets and arts activities. It's, it's all of it, right? And so it's more of that comprehensive holistic approach um, that we're able to map out and be able to talk about um, that I think is attractive to particular, particular people. I think it's really important for you know, the community to get involved and you know, stay engaged in what's happening and go and talk to developers and tell them you know, what you'd like to see and what you want. It's hard for us to kind of go out and just start engaging people, but I think through that, that neighborhood meeting process is really where that needs to happen. And we 
typically like to run a process of whether or not we're, we're required to have a neighborhood meeting. We like to have one and just, you know, hear what the neighbors have to say, hear what they want to see, hear what they want to care about and try to integrate that as much as possible into the project. Because again, you know, they're the ones who are going to be living next to it for a very long time. And so we want people to be happy and we want the community to really appreciate these developments we're doing. It's really important that people recognize that they can uh, contribute to all of this, that they're a part of all of this. So they can find out what's happening. They can go on our website. There's actually an interactive public art map and you can do a self-guided tour. There's a blog that has information about um, all the different um, artists who are in the community. There are lecture series that happen at the Castle House. There's artists and residents that come there and studio visits that people can come and see what the artists are doing. There's the Fettuccine Forum. So uh, there are a lot of different ways that people can get involved and participate and engage in what we're talking about. You can also buy, buy art, shop at the Record Exchange, shop at Rediscovered Books. You know, really think about where your dollars go and think about who you're paying attention to and participate because it, it, it takes a lot of work to do all these things. Um, be on boards for nonprofits, go to um, performances. So I think that the desire that people have sometimes to be on the internet and stay home is something that hurts our local environment because it isolates people. So the best thing you can do is get out of your house and, and participate in some capacity. I think what we're seeing is that arts economic development, which is an increasingly common practice that you're seeing municipalities undertake, uh, is an umbrella term. Um, over time, probably for the past 150 years or so, we've looked at art and its value to cities in different ways. So what we started off with the era of city beautiful and architecture and artists as uh, the way that we saw the value of art and culture in our communities has evolved. We don't just think about that anymore. We think about artists as an amenity to attract knowledge workers, so people that are highly educated because uh, people see that as the boon to the regional economy. Um, we see an evolution to looking at artists as entrepreneurs and innovators um, in their own right rather than just something that's nice to have. Uh, we see the evolution of um, artists uh, as community developers as a voice in the public arena um, of trying to bring attention and support and resources and different types of arts related development to low resource places. I think that the thing that's really important to remember is that arts economic development is no single thing. It is a accumulation of strategies and um, for us to talk about the city of Boise and the Treasure Valley, um, it's not a single indicator or factor, but a number of different attributes that make this a really great place um, for people um, to make a living as an artist and for artistic practice to happen. We just want to make sure that we can strengthen those attributes as best we can um, and not lose these people that have a variety of different skill sets that are really good for our economy. Looking at, at projects like the Multimodal Center and understanding how artists made that a habitable, habitable space that would have felt really different had art not been involved or going out to Boise Watershed and feeling, you know, what is it what is the landscape like? What is the building like? And how might that have been different if artists were not involved? You know, that's the kind of impact that we're, we're trying to make. We're trying to show how artists are a vital part of, of everything that we do. Doing more artists in residencies is something we really like to do in the future, where we bring an artist in residence to the, to the farm where our public works employees create compost. You know, how might an artist um, do art about that process? We get to play a role. We we see a real impact for the work that we do every day, which I think is not true for everyone and the work that they're doing. We see the ripples that we create, you know, in the community based on the decisions that we make here and the projects that we take on. I, th I think for the most part, well, the work, you know, the work on developing and maintaining the culture helps to instill a sense of pride and ownership. And I think the meaningful ways that we can incorporate input from the community and involvement helps to build that sense of trust, that sense of pride, that sense of ownership of this place. And that's what I think, yeah, makes, makes our culture strong and special.